Welcome to Drift Guitars, I'm Chris. Behind the camera is Matt, as always, doing fancy, fancy transitions like you just saw. That's why I pay him the big bucks. That's right. We're over here. That's right. In the last episode of the 3,000-year-old guitar, we cut the fret slots. Uh, and we hope that if you're following along at home, your fretboard looks like this. But now what we need to do is actually cut it to shape and we're gonna bind it. We're gonna put some maple binding on it so that it matches the body of the guitar. And we're gonna show you guys how we go about doing that. Remember, normally I do this on a CNC machine, uh, but we are choosing to do all of this by hand so that you guys can follow at home. And remember, if you are liking the 3000 year old guitar series that we've been putting out for two years now, uh, that you guys subscribe, check out below. Make sure you guys are subscribed. If you you're can't rush perfection. Channel. That's right. That's right. It's going to take time. Yeah. But yeah, make sure you guys are subscribers and you support the channel if uh, you regularly watch our videos. And we do appreciate that. Many ways that we can go about uh, skinning this cat. Uh, for me, as you can see on this piece of acrylic, I like to make my fretboards pretty much exactly to um, a tailor spec. Uh, that's just kind of what I landed on years ago. I, when I started learning how to play guitar, I was, I was playing Taylor, so I just kind of got used to that. They have the one and three quarter inch nut. It's just very comfortable. So what I did um, forever ago, when I, before I had my CNC's, I made this out of half inch acrylic. And what it is, is the exact width at the nut and the width at the end of the fretboard minus the binding. And for me, I use two millimeter wide binding. So if it's a 44 millimeter at the nut, this right here is 40 millimeters. Um, I think that makes sense, right? And we yeah. have the center line marked right here in the back of the acrylic. So what I need to do is I need to find the center line on this fretboard that I've cut the slots in. And we're gonna use, once again, the double-sided tape technique. And I'm gonna glue this thing down on here. And we're gonna use it as a template to cut this thing out. Absolutely perfect, hopefully. Uh, and make it kind of, you know, the more we can make these processes um, kind of mindless, the less chances you have of messing it up, especially if you're going to be building guitars kind of with the same specs. Um, take the time, make yourself a nice reliable template. Uh, it's just gonna make your life a lot easier. So what I need to do really, really fast is I need to get calipers. I forgot the calipers, Matt. Um, let me grab those. <laughs> okay, caliper in hand. What we're gonna do is we're gonna put the tape down on the fretboard. We've now switched to blue tape because we just ran out of the green tape. Uh, we're gonna set this on here roughly kind of in the middle. Doesn't gotta be perfect. And the reason we're doing that is because now I can take my calipers. I've already gone ahead and set it to the midpoint and we're just gonna take it and we're gonna run it right here. And that way we're not scratching the wood too much. <laughs> As I like break through the tape. And now when I go to glue this down, I'm gonna be able to line up the center line to the center line that we just drew. So I think that's making sense, right? Mm -hmm. Ain't no thang but a chicken wang. All right, so now we need to put some tape on this one. How are you going to see the line? It's a good question, Matt Miller. Yeah. It's a wonderful question. Let's see. I'll show you. If you guys don't have a template like this, if you're kind of like this is your first time building a guitar, um, you would kind of do the same thing. You would mark your center line on here. I still recommend using the tape, and then you're just going to go ahead and lay out from the center line, you know, half the width of what you need. And the same thing down here. Take a straight edge connect those dots and that's going to be your cut line. Remind, reminding you that if you are doing binding, you want to subtract the width of the binding. Um, if you're not doing binding, then you're going to go to the actual what you want your final numbers to be. Uh, so what we've got is Matt was asking how we're going to line these up because now we're not going to see it. You got to remember you can still, this goes beyond that point. So I'm just going to line up like that. Ah. Easy friggin peasy. All right, so we're going to do some super glue. I just use like a medium viscosity, in this case the Stumac number 20. It does. This doesn't have to be like crazy glued down. I'm not going to put accelerant on this because I want to have a little bit of t a few seconds to adjust it if I need to. So I'm going to line up my center mark right there. And I am taking this to the very edge of where the nut's going to be. Can you see it, Matt? Are we good? Hopefully it's coming yeah. out. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. And then I'm before I set it all the way down, we're just going to carefully line that up. Make sure that we're good there. Okay, I feel good about it. So now we're just going to kind of kind of wait. Um, a note on this. This is really important that you, you do find that center line when you do it. Um, because if this fretboard template that I'm using is slightly off at an angle in any way whatsoever, well, that's going to make it my frets slightly off at an angle. And so this has to be dead, dead on. Um, otherwise it'll really mess you up. And fret slots can be really frustrating because you can make a tiny mistake somewhere along the way 
and not realize it until you put strings on the guitar, which is at the very end. And then you're going to be like, man, why is this guitar just, it's all kinds of, I'm having tuning issues. And, uh, and I say this because I know my first few guitars, I had major issues with, um, fret slots not being perfect. And I had to do like a crazy compensated nut. And then I had to do a crazy compensated saddle. And it was like never amazing. It was always just like, it was good until you get to like the fifth fret. And you know, so, mm -hmm. so take your time, get this right, figure out a way that you can get accuracy within your budget. I think that that's kind of the way to, to do it because accuracy gets expensive. <laughs> so what we're gonna do now is um, a couple things I could do. Uh, I could just mark this if I wanted to, um, go to the bandsaw and rough cut it and then take it over to my edge sander and then sand all the way to the line. And there's a reason why I double-sided taped this to this because what I'm gonna do is actually put the flush cut bit on our router and I'm just gonna let it rip on that and, and make my life a lot easier. So I'm gonna do it backwards. I don't wanna change, <laughs> we don't wanna switch sides of the table here. So I'm actually gonna reach across the table and do it. So let me throw my bit in here real quick uh, and then we'll let this thing rip real fast. And poof, just like that, we have our um, flush cut bit inside of our router lift over here. Um, this is a, a spiral cut one, which is gonna work really, really well on this. So it depends on what, if you're doing this with a router, um, if you're using a, a straight flute one, you need to be a little bit more conscious of um, tear out because you can get some wicked tear out on this, uh, especially as we come across and go on the end grain of the wood. Uh, so just be careful there. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna throw my ears on. We're gonna turn this, uh, turn this on and um, let it rip. Okay, so we have our fretboard cut to size. Um, you will notice if, if we leave it in for the editing <laughs> that I did have uh, a little bit of a, a wrestling match with me when I was routing this. Um, I haven't done this in so long, I kind of forgot. You need to be just, it, the tear out situation on this is really easy to mess up. So I was actually having to go kind of push my, um, my wood in the wrong direction. Uh, but I was having to do that just so that I didn't get really bad tear out. So just be aware of that. Don't just freaking get in there and just push your, your fretboard into the uh, into the router bit because it's so like well quarter sawn. And because there's a slight taper to this, it's very easy if you're going this direction against the taper, it's you're gonna blow out something and ruin the whole piece. But we were able to prevent that. Let's see. <laughs> Boom. We have a fretboard that is absolutely perfect at this point. The sides of these could probably use just a slight little touch up with some sandpaper just to get them absolutely smooth, but they look really, really nice. Um, I don't know if you could see that. Just the slightest little chatter marks maybe. Uh, but really cool thing too is what we, what we have is a fretboard that now is ready to accept our binding. See how it's, it's two millimeters narrower on each side, which is perfect. So we can kind of go ahead and get this ready to go um, for um, fretboard binding, which is super cool. Um, but what I think I'm gonna do before we do that is I'm gonna just put this in a vise real quick and just make sure that I got it nice and smooth and we'll grab some binding. Um, the only other thing that I really need to make sure that um, is sorted is when I cut these fretboards out is I make them too long. So I'm gonna bring um, one of my grand sessions over here real quick and show you how to go about measuring that real fast. Okay, um, so what we do on my guitars on these grand sessions in this one particular, it is a 14 fret. Um, neck, which for those of you that don't know, 14th fret means that it, the neck meets the body at the 14th fret. So instead of me just kind of like holding this on here, because we have not cut the mortise and tenon on the neck yet, what I'm going to do is count 14, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, I'll do it, I always do it twice, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So I'm going to line up the 14th fret with the edge of the body, um, and you can see if I left this where it's at, it kind of overhangs over the sound hole a little bit. 
Um, so what I tend to do in this one is I'm probably going to go ahead and cut it like right around there. Probably be where I cut it because um, that'll give me the opportunity to let, um, by the time I put the binding on, I like to, I'll get a clean edge on here. I like to let my fretboard go to right about there. That's about how much of an overhang I like. This is one of those um, season to taste kind of situations though, like do do what you want to do. I know that some people some people really like to have it kind of overhanging the sound hole. Some people leave a little bit of a, uh, it goes above it. So it's just your choice. I like to get mine pretty much right on it. Or just Tony Rice's of the world, where it's just like a landing strip out over the sound <laughs> exactly. hole. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, all I got to do is run that over to the bandsaw, lop this end off, and then we will begin doing uh, doing the binding on here. Uh, so let me do that real fast. Yeah. All right, cool. So now we have our fretboard really nice and cleaned up. I have cut this to the exact spot that's going to make me happy whenever we glue the binding on and everything's going to be the right size. Uh, the next thing that we are going to do is to put our binding on. Um, I went over and looked at the um, guitar that we're building, the 3000 year old, and uh, found some binding that's going to match it. Remember, uh, if, if you're doing wooden binding, um, that even if you're using the same species, they can be drastically different than one another, uh, especially like maple binding. Holy mother. Uh, there's been times where like you're not paying attention, you throw some maple binding on and like it's like a super pink version of a maple versus another one that's really a light colored. So make sure that you do color match all your stuff. So um, this is nice and figured, but what we're going to do is get this glued on to both sides of this fretboard. Uh, what I do is I just cut it proud. It's important that you encourage your fretboards. Uh, I also try to find the side that's got the most figuring in it because we want we want that to be super pretty. Another thing I do is the most figured piece of binding I put on on the um, base side of the guitar because that's the side that the player is going to see. Uh, cut it a little proud here and then we're going to cut it a little proud here. Okay. Don't need that anymore. <laughs> what I do is I use my edge sander because uh, it's more accurate. You're not going to get any tear out. You can also do this with a chisel if you've got some mad chisel skills and you have a really really sharp chisel. Um, another thing, uh, God, we sound like we sound like Stumac uh, hawks all the time. <laughs> another thing that you can do is Stumac sells um, this this tool that goes inside your drill press and it's basically a chisel. And, and it works really well and you can use it. It puts perfect plumb cuts on your on your binding. And I used one for years, they're really good. Um, I don't have one of those anymore. Uh, but what we're gonna do is we'll go over to the edge sander real quick and I'm gonna put 245s on this. Uh, I know that this is not exactly a 90 degree, um, but 45 um, degree angle on this as a miter works really well for it. So let me pop two 90s on here and then I'm gonna walk you through how to get a really, really good tight miter joint on this. Okay, so these two outside pieces, this is how I recommend going about doing this. Um, these two outside pieces, I have gone ahead and put the 45 degree angles on them. Uh, you can see that they stick out proud on this side. Matt's looking at the wrong part. <laughs> they stick out uh, proud over here. So the nice thing is, is we have some lateral movement here that we can move things around. So you can go ahead and put your final 45 degree angles in this piece if you'd like. On the end piece, what I've done is I've done one side with the 45 degree angle. And I hope all this is showing up on camera pretty good. But what we're going to do is butt these up against each other down here and get that right. That looks good, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing that I can do at this point now is take a pencil. Um, I tend to try to put a, uh, a sharp edge on it. Yeah. So that it's at an angle. And then I can come over here. I know I'm on the wrong side, Matt. I'm sorry. Uh, and we're just going to hit that right there. Okay. Uh, so to, to back up one more time, so you're going to butt these two up against each other so you know that this side is perfect. Mm -hmm. Hold it in place and then mark the other side with a pencil. Okay. And then what I can do is I'm gonna run over to the edge sander again, and I'm very carefully going to put another 45 degree in it. Take I'm, your 90 or your 45 all the way to that line? To the edge of the pencil. Okay. Uh, and it's probably still gonna be not enough, but I wanna check it before it's gone too far, and then we're just gonna probably do a couple more quick passes on the sandpaper and get it perfect. So if you're doing it with a chisel, it'd be the exact same way you'd come down, you know, and put, you know what, let's do this one with a chisel, just so that you guys can see. Uh, a fun a fun trick for those of you at home who are using chisels is 
Um, the way that you can make sure that you're getting a 90 degree angle is you use the reflection in the chisel. Can you see that? Okay, so I'll, I'll just do it. We're not able to get this to focus on camera, but a way that you can make sure that you're getting good 45 degree angles on miters with a chisel is you're actually looking in the reflection on the back of your chisel mm -hmm. and you're looking for a 90 degree angle. Uh, and if you're, if you're getting what visually looks like a 90 degree angle, you know that you're really close to a, um, a 45. Little, little trick there. But I'm gonna come over here so you guys can see what I'm doing, moving on to that line. Uh, and you're gonna walk up to it. You're not gonna get there in one chisel pass. You're gonna slowly get there. Ah, uh, jeez. It's really close, right? Mm -hmm. I'm doing this backwards too, so. <laughs> okay, so we chiseled that back. Now we're going to, we're all just dry fitting at this point. We know this side's going to be good. I think, and then I can move that out of the way and then we can check and make sure that this side is good. It's kind of hard to do with dry fit. You can also yeah. tape it in place to kind of check it, but that looks pretty, pretty, good. pretty stinking good right there. Yeah, there we go. Boom. Those look really nice with one another. Nice. Cool. So now for the last little process here. Um, one thing I do want to mention before we glue on the binding is, um, this is going to be the rare person, but if you are doing like a crazy elaborate inlay on a guitar, I don't know if you know this, but I'm known for <laughs> doing crazy inlays on guitars. What? A lot of the times it's easier to go, and if you know what your inlay is going to be, it's easier to do your inlay now. Um, on this blank canvas before you've put it on the neck, before you've put the binding on. And the reason why I say before you put the binding on it is because if, you're, if, you, um, if your inlay goes all the way to the edge of this, you can just go ahead and spill it off of it uh, and then trim it down to make it flush and then you're gonna glue your binding on and it's gonna be perfect. So just a quick note on those of you that maybe are doing inlays that come all the way to the edge of the fretboard um, and you wanna bind it. So what we're gonna do is move over to the vise real quick and then I'm gonna show you how I go about gluing this on uh, because uh, you're actually not gonna use any clamps whatsoever and uh, let's get that set up real fast. Okay, we're gonna get this in here. I'm gonna have it so that it sticks up quite a bit. Get it in place. Um, actually, actually no. <laughs> Like I said, been a while. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this in this way because the one that you should do first, I've learned this the hard way, the one you need to do first is actually the end piece. That's why it's important that you get it right out of the gate um, so that you can make sure that everything's fitting correctly on here. Um, what I recommend using is um, binding tape. The binding tape is the way to do this. I have tried to do it many ways. In fact, when I first started doing these, I actually um, super glued these in place and that's just, not the way to do it. Um, super glue is too brittle. Um, all it would take is just the slightest little ding uh, against something, you know, and and you can your binding is going to want to pop off. Uh, whereas wood glue is going to be much more structurally sound. Yeah, losing a little LMI wood glue. We're not gonna we're not gonna get nuts here. We're just gonna put a little little, little dab. Do you? Um, I actually don't want to get too much squeeze out on this. There we go. Turn this around. Get yourself a nice freshy piece. The other thing that I recommend is in order to make sure that you're gluing this in the right spot, take one of your other pieces and you're gonna use it to line up and get them, get them right. That's right where I want it. I'm being very careful not to move it. And we're gonna tape it down. And then while it's still just sitting there, we're gonna double check and make sure that we're getting good there, boom. That looks really perfect, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Right around there, right there. And then we're gonna go ahead and just get the last couple pieces on here. This binding tape is is the way to do it though, because you can put a lot of pressure on it. Cool. Yep. Okay, so that looks good. The thing I want to note too is that um, uh, where am I gluing this on at? I'm gluing it on so that. You can see here that some of, some of the binding is sticking out from this side of the fretboard and some of the binding is sticking out on that side of the fretboard. I want it to be a little bit proud so that once all this glue is dry, I can go ahead and sand this smooth and make sure that it's perfect. Um, problem is, is if you, if you, on the bottom of the fretboard, if the binding is like slightly high like that, when you go to glue your fretboard onto your guitar, you're going to end up with a gap right there and it'll be ugly. So now we can take this, come over here. 
I feel like I'm forgetting something. <laughs> We'll find out in another episode, won't we? Uh, I'm gonna use a little bit of glue here. Once again, we're not gonna get nuts. I don't wanna get a crap ton of um, glue down inside the fret slots. You know, with a bound fretboard, it's harder to uh, to get down in those fret slots. So we're gonna then take this. Let's see which one's got more figure on it. Though for me, I'm gonna use the one that's slightly less figured and put it on this side, um, just because you know this is the side that the artist does not see a little bit more glue. Really? There he is. Come on. Here we go. That's better. Um, we're going to put a little bit of glue on the miter itself, just a touch. You always want to start down here at the miter. We want to come down here. I'm going to take it. Um, it's still a little high here, and we're going to push into it and make sure that it's nice and tight. And then get that thing down nice and good. So we should be able to see now at this point, right? Yeah, see how good that is? It's looking really nice and clean. Once you got that in place. There it is. Yeah. yeah. And once you got that in place, we're just gonna come across here about every inch or so and just go to go to town on it real quick. And you can see because I'm using the tape dispenser, a little shameless plug there, um, it just goes really, really fast. I don't have to constantly be worrying about tearing things off. I'm not going to put any tape right now where the vise is. We'll just skip that for a second. The other thing that I'm being conscious of once again is that I'm making sure that the binding is kind of smack in the middle of the fretboard with hang off on this side and hang off on that side. Um, so just be paying attention to that. Okay, so we're good on that side. That looks really good. Double checking while the glue is wet that you do have overhang on both sides because you, you can move it just a little bit here. That looks nice. We're gonna flip it and reverse it. Is your frame in there for it? Yep. And they do the exact same thing um, to get everything right where it needs to go. I need to get some more glue. <laughs> so if you guys haven't done bound fret boards before, um, it's, it's not uh, it's not rocket science, not rocket surgery, if you will. Uh, I think some people have a misconception that you do your bound fret boards by like actually using a router, kind of like the way you cut binding channels in a guitar body. But it's, as you can see, it's it's just different than that. Making sure that we get it butted up really nice and tight. That looks good. The top side looks really nice. The bottom side looks, it's got the slightest of gaps. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna put a piece of tape right on the end there to get that tightened up. Cause like I said, on this side, it's actually perfect. Um, and since that's the bottom, you know, if we're gonna have a little bit of a, off. That's fine. Now, something else I was going to say too is if you wanted to do um, pearl as well, like a pearl bound fretboard, like I have done on a lot of my guitars, this one just doesn't happen to have pearl on it, is before you put your binding on, I would then set up my router table to cut a rabbit channel right down there, the width and the depth of my pearl. I put my pearl in with super glue and then I would put my binding over that. So that's kind of, I hope that, I hope that makes sense. I'll be that guy in the room. What's a rabbit channel? <laughs> <laughs> a rabbit channel. Well, it's like, um, like a TV station that mostly airs things about, uh, rabbits. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, a rabbit is like, um, if we're looking at the side profile of the fretboard mm -hmm. or the end of it, it'd be little pockets like that. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, and so our binding would go here. Right. And then that's where our pearl goes, is inside here. You know, it's funny, whenever you say that, I look at that and I, I totally think of a rabbit. <laughs> I don't make up the names, okay? Um, <laughs> that was sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so what we had, that's what you would do if you're gonna do pearl on your fretboard. You can't just make up stuff, okay? <laughs> exactly. Chris Alvarado, you can't just make up words. Somebody's gonna be like, well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but what we have now is a bound fretboard that is pretty much, uh, kind of structurally done at this point. Once this is dry, the last thing that I need to do is then run it through my drum sander. 
Um, and if you don't have a drum sander, you could use a hand plane and you're just gonna take the top of this flush to there. And especially being very, very careful on the backside to get this absolutely flat so that when you glue it to your fretboard, it's good to go. Um, and the other thing that I would do before I glue this down to my neck, which we'll talk about in the next episode, is I would actually go about radiusing this to my desired radius. But with that, I think that uh, we are ready to be done with this episode. Uh, I hope you guys learned a little something. Make sure you guys subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one.